Hi, and you're now with the Forerunner Chronicles. Hi, everybody. So, sorry for the poor video quality, but unfortunately, while I was in LA at the airport, someone stole my video equipment. So, I'm in the South Pacific right now on a mission, but I have some important information that I have to share with you, and it just can't wait. Listen to this. When former President of the United States of America, Lyndon B. Johnson, was a senator in Texas, he introduced measures that were to make an amendment to tax code in the year 1954. That amendment came to be known as the Johnson Amendment. Now what the Johnson Amendment effectively did was it restricted nonprofit organizations from using their voices and their finances to influence the political process, to oppose political candidates for office, or to promote political candidates for office. And if for some reason a nonprofit organization didn't comply with the Johnson Amendment, they would immediately be stripped of their tax exempt status. And that is something that the Christian churches in the USA have despised about the Johnson Amendment ever since its introduction in the year 1954. However, many secular agencies in the USA have praised the Johnson Amendment as one of the most effective measures to ensure the separation of church and state. Now, Fast forward to 2016 when President Donald Trump was just presidential candidate Donald Trump looking for any successful avenue by which he could seize the presidential nomination. And this led him to have a very interesting and important sit down with some of the most influential Christian leaders in the United States of America in Trump Towers. In March 7th of 2016, as Donald Trump was making a stump speech, he recounts the events of that day. I want you to listen closely to this. Jerry Falwell Jr. was so helpful. He was so helpful. You know, I'm leading with the evangelicals. I'm a good Christian. And I'm leading with the evangelicals. And I want to tell you something. Jerry was so great. Uh, Pastor Jeffress. I mean, we have so many people. But I'll tell you this. Christianity, and I put it in the same vein, and sometimes in the same sentences, Christianity is being chipped away at in this country, in this country. It's being chipped away at, and I'm not going to let it happen. Do you know I was with... I was with a whole room full, like 50 uh, pastors, ministers, great people, some of whom I knew pretty well and some I don't. And I said to him, let me ask you a question. How many Christians, evangelicals, but just Christians, do we have in this country? And they were saying maybe 250 million, maybe 260 million. I said, so that's more than we have women. It's more than we have men. It's by far the biggest group. Then why aren't you banding together and getting the kinds of things you want? When, When people talk about we need a temporary ban on Muslims until we find out what is going on here, okay? There is total outrage. When people talk about Christians and Christianity, no outrage. There's no outrage. I said, let me ask you, and these are great believers, these are great people, these are strong people, smart people. I said, why is it, and I think I really found something that's very important for all of us, why is it that you people don't have a stronger lobby? And during Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson's regime, I will call it, because that's sort of what it was, if you think about it, but during his term as president, they passed something where the tax deduction is under siege if they do anything that's a little bit off. Okay? So they're going to lose tax-exempt status, right? And I said, wait a minute, that's right, that's the answer. I figure, you know, I'm a pretty smart guy, I figure things out pretty quickly. So as soon as I mentioned it, I said, that's it. Because I said then, so the man walking, I was in Trump Tower, I pointed down to the sidewalk, there were people walking on the sidewalk. I said, then those people walking on the sidewalk are more powerful than you people in the clergy, the pastors, the ministers, the priests, the people in the clergy, they're more powerful. They said, that's right. I said, not going to happen anymore. We're going to get rid of that thing. I want Christianity to have a strong flavor. Why did we ever pass a thing like that? And, and it's so important. I mean, really, they've shut Christianity down. And these are great people, but they're afraid to do. For instance, some people came up to me. Mr. Trump, I love you. You're the best. You're going to be the greatest leader. You're going to be. I want to endorse you. I'm endorsing you. 
but I'm not allowed to do it publicly because if I do it publicly, I may lose for the church the tax-exempt status. So they're really being silenced, and we can't let that happen. We can't let that happen. I don't care about the endorsement. They're really being silenced. We can't let that happen. We're not going to let it happen, and we're going to get that thing repealed. And think of the power we have over the Democrats, over the Republicans. I mean, the power is... The power is incredible. So we're going to get that taken care of. In the words of Donald Trump himself, the removal of the Johnson Amendment would empower the Christian churches in the United States of America to have unrivaled influence on the political process unlike any other voter bloc that is in existence. To be quite frank, if the Johnson Amendment is removed, it will effectually erase the separation that exists between church and state, placing the church in a position of influence where they could use millions, even billions of dollars, tax deductible dollars to influence the political process. And that is an extreme amount of influence that no other entity within the borders of this country, meaning the United States of America, can boast. And in 2017, when Donald Trump became the next president of the United States of America, in a very unprecedented fashion, I might add, he immediately began to make good on his promises to the Christian right that was responsible for his success. Because on the very first national day of prayer, Donald Trump made it a point of responsibility for himself to sign an executive order that would effectually give relief to the churches in general from the restrictions that were imposed upon them by the Johnson Amendment. Key word here is relief and not repeal because the Johnson Amendment could not be repealed via an executive order. The only way that the Johnson Amendment could be repealed is through congressional action. By the way, as soon as Donald Trump made it his promise to the Christian right that he was going to get rid of the Johnson Amendment, it became the official policy of the Republican Party that that was a part of their agenda for 2017 to get rid of the Johnson Amendment. Which brings us to what just happened bright and early this past Saturday morning. Now, most of you out there may know that the Republican Party just made history by voting into law tax legislation that is going to radically revamp the tax code unlike anything that's been seen since 1986. But what most of you out there didn't know is that within this historic tax legislation that was voted into law by the Congress this past Saturday morning, bright and early, there were provisions for the gutting out of the Johnson Amendment. Ladies and gentlemen, when that tax legislation was voted into law bright and early this past Saturday morning while you were sleeping in your bed or binge watching Netflix, the wall that separated church and state effectually came crumbling down. The Christian churches in the United States of America were unleashed on the political process, now giving back their voice and the opportunity to open up their pocketbooks and unleash their unlimited financial resources to influence the politics of the USA. And you didn't even know it. My friends, Bible prophecy is literally taking place right now. And the Bible declared that it would be measures like this one that was just passed into law bright and early this past Saturday morning that would be the very means by which the introduction of the mark of the beast would become a reality. Because when the Bible identifies the prophetic rise of the United States of America in the book of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11, it states, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And it had two horns like a lamb, and it spake like a dragon. Now a beast in Bible prophecy, according to Daniel chapter 7 verses 2 and 3, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 17, which says, These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. And Daniel chapter 7 and verse 23, which declares the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. A beast in Bible prophecy is simply a kingdom or a political power, a nation. And Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11 speaks of a prophetic beast or a political power 
a nation rising up out of the earth, possessing two horns like a lamb. In the book of John chapter 1 and verse 29, the scripture declares, And the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. The Lamb in the Bible primarily stands as a symbol of Jesus Christ. Therefore, identifying the fact that this political power, this nation in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11, that is rising into prominence, is one that professes to be a Christian nation. Therefore, it will profess to promote some of the tenets of Jesus Christ himself. And one of these tenets are found in the book of Matthew chapter 22 and verse 21, where Jesus, the Lamb of God himself, declared, Render therefore unto Caesars the things which are Caesars, and unto God the things that be God's. Ladies and gentlemen, in very concise language, Jesus Christ himself established the principle of the separation of church and state. A principle which was championed by the United States of America like no other nation in the history of planet Earth. However, this is going to radically change and has already began down that route because the scripture declared that this nation, the United States of America, would one day speak like a dragon. The only way that a nation can speak is through its legislative bodies and its judicial officials. When the representatives of the various states of the United States of America come together and draft legislation which is supposed to be in favor of their constituents and then they vote it into law, we say that the people have spoken. And hence, when legislation goes forth from Congress, that is the speech of the nation. And the Bible tells us that legislation is going to go forth out of the legislative halls in the United States of America that will reveal the speech of the dragon. And ladies and gentlemen, when that legislation goes forward, it will destroy the separation of church and state and bring about a union of these two entities. And the way we can know this of a surety is because the scripture declares in Revelation 13 and verse 2, and he, meaning the United States of America, exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, that being the beast in Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 through 8, which is nothing more than a prophetic symbol of the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, which throughout antiquity was a religious political entity, a system that united church and state. Go back to Revelation 13 and verse 12, and the scripture says once again concerning the United States of America, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. If a political power is causing the citizens of its nation to worship, my friends, that means the politics have entered into the church. The church and the state have found themselves on a platform of union, and that's what's going to take place here in the USA. A union of church and state which will come about through the enforcing of legislation that will cause the very citizens of the United States of America as well as the geographical region in which that nation is located to collectively engage in worship of the first beast of Revelation chapter 13 and that being the Roman Catholic Church the papacy led out by the Pope and ladies and gentlemen there's only one type of legislation that could cause both the inhabitants and the very land, the geographical region in which those inhabitants reside to engage in worship. It will have to be some type of Sabbath legislation because in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8, where God tells us to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, He calls us to refrain from all labor, therefore, the very land upon which man labors will have to rest as well. And my friends, the only type of Sabbath legislation, or might I say false Sabbath legislation, that could be implemented that would actually fit the prophetic symbolism of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 12 would have to be legislation that would require Sunday as a day of rest. Because Sunday as a day of rest was implemented by the supposed authority of the Roman Catholic Church and its popes. Therefore, when the United States of America, through legislation, will require its citizens to rest on Sunday, they will be calling for us to vicariously pay homage to the papacy. And the Bible declares in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, meaning the Antichrist power, 
whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We are right now in the very last lap of the great controversy and this race will end in eternity. Eternal destruction for some and eternity in the paradise which God has prepared for all them that love him and by faith will keep his commandments by looking unto the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. What is your decision? Don't you realize that it is time for us to set aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and to with patience run the race that has been set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross for you, despised the shame for you, and is even now set down at the right hand of the Father for you as your high priest, as your intercessor, as your advocate. And he tells you, come boldly unto the throne of grace, that you might obtain mercy and grace to help in your time of need. And that time is now. Will you accept his invitation and repent of your sins and receive the grace of God unto salvation? That choice, my friends, is yours. And I pray that you'll choose wisely. As always, this is the forerunner. Whether you like it or not, the truth is the truth.